Welcome to Classical Education, a podcast for those who believe in rediscovering the art of asking questions, engaging in conversation, and attending to the ideas at the heart of well-ordered teaching and learning. Adrian Fries and Trey Bailey invite you to join them on a journey in pursuit of the true, the good, and the beautiful as we participate in the great conversation and listen to the many voices coming from the world of classical education. Today we are here with two wonderful guests that I recently met at a classical education summit in Austin, Texas. Dr. David Rose, Professor of Economics, University of Missouri, St. Louis, Senior Fellow with Common Sense Society, and Dr. Lawrence Reed, President Emeritus Foundation for Economic Education. Trey and I are very excited to have them here to talk about civics and economics. We think this is a very, very important um, conversation um, to have, especially for um, the emergence of the in the growth of classical schools. Trey, why don't you go ahead and get us started with our first question? Yeah, so good. Uh, welcome to both of you. Thank you for being here with us. And I wonder if you could maybe just take us back to the very beginning with some basic definitions here. And uh, I'd love to hear from each of you, perhaps you could both contribute to a working definition. Uh, what do we mean when we use the word civics? And perhaps another definition, what do we mean when we use the word economics? And who would you like to answer that first? Either one. Uh, let, let me go ahead and go. Uh, the, the, civics is uh, defined in a number of ways. My favorite way of defining it is as the study of the rights and responsibilities of citizens in good standing in a society. Uh, and I think that that actually is a pretty good definition. It's not my definition, it's, it's kind of a, a standard one. I would add that uh, a, a, a crucial part of civics uh, has to do with the instantiation of uh, certain moral and scientific beliefs, moral beliefs about right and wrong and scientific beliefs about how the world works uh, that need to be inculcated early in life so uh, they operate in uh, what, what's known as uh, system one thinking. In other words, kind of an automatic, intuitive, unthinking thinking. Like when you see somebody do something that you know is wrong and you immediately feel disgusted and, and that you should enter that kind of thinking. That, that's a front-loaded kind of thinking. It's a really important part of a society's culture. So one of the reasons why I'm so interested in civic economics uh, is because of my earlier work on culture where I've given a lot of thought to um, this idea that what allows us to get along well and harmonize well is uh, due to an early investment by parents into constructing neural architecture early, very early in life between most of this work needs to be done before the age of eight. Uh, and surely by the time you're in the young adulthood, you've lost your window of opportunity where the brain is very, very uh, plastic and receptive to learning. So I, I see a very tight connection between civics and culture. Okay, thank you. Lawrence, go ahead. Yeah, I, I agree with Dave uh, with what he said. I see civics as uh, the examination of what it means to be a good citizen. And in my mind, that suggests such things as a good grounding in the history of the polity that uh, you live in. It means some understanding of the basic values that people share uh, within that polity, uh, some uh, understanding of its literature as well as its governance. What are the governing institutions and how does one participate in those things in a constructive way? All of that is civics education in my book. Um, the second part of uh, Trey's question was uh, concerning economics. And I see economics, and this is not a definition I've come up with. It's uh, kind of a classical definition. It, it is the study of conscious human action. 
in a world of limited resources. We don't live a, in a Garden of Eden where you can have as much as you want of anything whenever you want it. A, a world of limited resources and unlimited wants. So you have a kind of uh, conflict on paper there uh, to, to begin with. How do you satisfy unlimited wants? Everybody wants whatever uh, they can think of and more of it. How do you satisfy those wants in a world where uh, the resources are limited? And that leads you down the path to a discussion of things like how prices are determined, how markets work, the profit motive, uh, how businesses are structured, uh, profit and loss, and, and related matters. That's economics, I think, in a nutshell. Yeah, I, I think that actually leads us straight into this idea of cooperation that I heard Dr. Rose sharing about at the summit. Can you take our listeners back to the theme on cooperation that you gave at the summit? And um, I gathered there that the relationships is what we focus on for good for a good education model. Tell us how cooperation works in economics. Uh, sure. Uh, economics traditionally has focused on the nature of exchange between people because, and, and that's for good reason. Uh, exchange type behavior, you know, we trade a certain number of dollar bills for good or one good for another, is pretty unique to humans. There's a only really, you have to really stretch your imagination to believe you're seeing true exchange between any other animal other than humans. So we focus on uh, exchange, we focus on the terms of that exchange, which is why market prices are so important, because market prices determine the terms at which we exchange with one another. So that's the centrality of that is important and it's a super, super important thing that economists did. The problem with that is it basically starts the story of economics too far downstream for people to properly understand it. Um, in my view, uh, there are really only two uh, types of transactions that produce benefits to transacting behavior generally that forms the basic unit of analysis of economic behavior. One is the gains from cooperation, one is the gains from exchange. Now, this has been known for a long time. Adam Smith talked about this, but he didn't use these words. He talked about the gains from trade, but in his discussion of the gains from trade, he had a closed story where the gains from exchange and the gains from cooperation were working to reinforce one another in his story. His story is absolutely correct, but it's very difficult for most people to really grasp. And even a lot of economists, if you ask them what Adam Smith's main ideas were, they'll give you, um, the, the, many of them will give you uh, the idea of comparative advantage, which really is more David Ricardo than, than Adam Smith. So in a, a long story short, uh, the gains from cooperation are very, very simple and they explain most of the most important social behavior, including pretty much all of the behavior that falls under the auspices of economics. And that a cooperation is simply the idea that when we work together, we do better than the sum of the parts. So alone, I make 10 units of something, alone, Larry makes 10 units of something. But when we work together, when we cooperate, we make 26. Not, not 20, which is what your brain expects, 26. By working together, uh, the value of the whole is greater than the value of the sums of the parts. And this is a wonderful thing. And this is, this is why it's good to be human. Humans are really, really good at communication compared to most other species. And so we are able to figure out ways to work together that are simply beyond the ability of most animal species to do. And so we've co-evolved a whole bunch of personality traits and uh, predilections that make us eager to cooperate with each other, which is one reason why we enjoy cooperating mm -hmm. with each other, uh, because it's a hugely important thing. So this is to me is the foundation of economics because this is where productive behavior begins. First within the house, and within a hunter-gatherer band. But then later, we get so productive, we, have, we, we make more stuff than we can consume ourselves. And we think, well, should we just consume more leisure and not work as hard, you know, because we're so, such good cooperators? That's one thing that we could do. But another thing that we could do is take some of that extra output that comes from our extra productivity 
and trade it for stuff that we don't have. That's how exchange fuels cooperation. Without enough to trade, there's no trading. So cooperation fuels exchange. So this grand story of economic development is one where gains in cooperation fuel exchange, ever increasing market efficiency makes the value of cooperation grow ever more, makes us try harder to cooperate better, creates more stuff, we exchange more, and it just keeps feeding on itself and feeding on itself. And the people who do the best are the ones that cooperate the best, the people who do the best are the ones that exchange the best, and that, that humanizes us, that makes us work hard to get along with other people, it makes us cosmopolitan, it makes our lives interesting. This is interesting. You call it the story of economic development. Is there a good book you recommend to, to read about this? Wow. You know, Larry would be a much better person <laughs> for that question, honestly. Um, Larry, what do you think? Well, one of the classics of all time uh, is always at the top of my list, and that is Henry Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson. He uh, early on explains that uh, in an economic sense, cooperation is uh, always a voluntary thing. Uh, you might say uh, if a thief is pointing a gun at your head and you do what he tells you, you might say, well, you're cooperating with him. But most people wouldn't think of that as cooperation. It's a voluntary thing motivated by the desire on the part of each person to be better off when all is said and done than he was before he engaged in whatever the transaction may be. Uh, so economics in one lesson is a good one. Uh, Thomas Sowell's, uh, what's his economics text called, David? Uh, is it basic economics? Basic economics, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's very, very good too. <laughs> I was wondering if you were going to bring up Thomas Sowell in this, because right. I think we have a lot of Thomas Sowell fans out there. Oh, great. He's always good on everything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I felt like this this idea of cooperation was really, really important because that's obviously what we really want when we are educating our students. We want them to learn that. That's a skill and it's an art is, you know, it's so natural as a human to want to have relationships with other people. Yeah. And so learning it those also frames economics in a totally different way. The way we teach economics normally today is we just dive into the story in midstream with abstract models about how pricing is determined in market. And that's all very interesting to people who have that kind of abstract reasoning mind. But most people don't. And so for most people, this is like painful. Uh, however, if you start with cooperation, then all, all of a sudden economics, We, by, by the way, I define, I personally define economics to, to emphasize that the, the, the standard definition uh, of economics is uh, the, the study of, of the allocation of scarce resources. It's not wrong with that definition, but it's just kind of empty. It doesn't tell you much, but it's it's not incorrect. It just doesn't tell you that much. But I but I personally believe uh, the the better definition of, of economics is it's the study of the mechanisms that facilitates cooperations mm. in large societies. If humans cooperate really well in small groups, it comes naturally to us, it's no big deal. This is one of the reasons why we like life in small groups so much, and we so frequently form small groups to do things. But if you think about it, almost everything in economics is considered part of the modern canon is of absolutely no value to understanding hunter-gatherers. There's no money, there's no markets, there's no assets, there's no banks, there, there's no interest, there's none of that because those things evolve as ways to give us indirect ways to cooperate with each other on massive scales. And so what makes economics so powerful is it allows us to see how cooperation can be effectuated in a multitude of ways at various levels of social strata to tremendous effect that you wouldn't be able to discern from your own personal bilateral behavior. So it's really powerful but there's no reason for your brain to evolve any of those mechanisms to appreciate it because our evolution took place in small groups. So what makes economics cool is what makes it really hard and counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. But it's incredibly important because if you get it wrong, you can have millions upon millions of people dying. And this has happened repeatedly in human history where people thought they could do better 
than letting the market basically work itself out. And they're just wrong. Nobody's that small. Hmm. Trey, do you have any questions before we keep? I have more, but I'd like to let you have a chance. Well, Dr. Rose, you mentioned something in your in your comments earlier on in the, our conversation about the importance of children learning uh, something. I, I can't remember exactly what it was. That's because, um, or, or that's that's why I'd like to go back to what you're saying. Something about the importance of them learning something. I think before the age of eight, you mentioned, and then your comments here about small groups, of course. Uh, remind me of the, the importance of the family as it relates to larger economic models. So maybe let's take our conversation for a minute and 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 put it right smack dab at home in, in the smallest of small groups, the family, and, and children learning about economics in the, the life of the home. Well, I think the family is incredibly important, and I talk about it quite a bit in my most recent book, uh, Why Culture Matters Most. There's this weird problem um, as society becomes more advanced, as we've moved through the modern age and become more efficient and so on and so forth, when it comes to the superficial aspects of the family, it appears that the family is less important than before. I mean, you can imagine uh, in 1720 on the, on the pioneer um uh, edge of, of life, uh, a husband and wife and a couple of kids uh, living in a log cabin, absolutely depend on each other incredibly. They, they have no chance if they don't function tightly as a family. That's really easy to see. And of course, today, it's not unusual at all for somebody to start a family by themselves. And it's not, while it may not be a good idea and you might not approve of it, it certainly can be done and it's certainly feasible. So modern life makes it look like the family isn't as important as it used to be. However, the problem with that thought is it's just dead wrong. Mm -hmm. The kind of society that we live in and that we benefit so much from, we are able to benefit from because we have institutions that can exist in our society that cannot exist in most societies. These are institutions, ways of doing things that only work in very, very high trust contexts. Most societies are not high trust societies. Most societies are low trust societies. So many of the things that we do automatically and without thought and with little fear are things that no one would ever bother in most of the world. And yet it's through those very behaviors that we're able to cooperate with one another in ways that make us spectacularly rich. So what does that have to do with the family? If you want to have a very high trust society, the only way you can have it is to have a critical mass of highly trustworthy people. Mm -hmm. And if you want to have highly trustworthy people in society, so much so that it's irrational to presume a randomly drawn stranger is untrustworthy. Yeah. The joke's on you. You're not engaging in as many uh, positive transactions as you could because you're being too cynical, right? If you want to have that high of a number, the only way to achieve that is to have very intense uh, teaching and uh, operant conditioning of moral beliefs that strongly support steadfast trustworthiness, to teach children that you, you don't lie, you don't cheat, you don't steal, it's wrong, it's categorically wrong. We're not gonna talk about a weighing the elements or whatever, this is just stuff you don't do. It's a matter of your character mm -hmm. in the sense of Aristotle. It's a, it's a, it needs to be a part of who you are. You need to be a trustworthy person, not because it's a good idea, not because it's prudent, but because it is wrong to not be, and it is right to be. And you should feel good about yourself when you know you behave, you're a trustworthy person. This needs to be driven into children at a very young age and reinforced over and over again so that as they grow older with their friends, they can't help but notice that their friends are kind of echoing the same thing. Mm -hmm. Because if they don't see that consistency, they'll very quickly understand that they are chumps, that they're playing a game one way, you know, everyone else is playing the game the other, and they're always on the losing end, and that is incredibly demoralizing and unreal. We have found no mechanism in the history of mankind that can adequately substitute for the family to intensely inculcate those kinds of beliefs and reinforce them. 
there might be a mechanism. It's possible. We just have never found one yet. And I really doubt that it's going to be there because raising a child can have a very strong ethical character, one that produces somebody who's just unthinkingly system one, Daniel Kahneman, unthinkingly trustworthy. That's very hard work. And it also requires that the parents not only work hard to put it in there, the parents also have to be very, very careful to never, ever set the wrong example and ever be revealed to be hypocrites. And this is just very, very difficult. Yeah, People this, will do that with their children, but they won't do that with everyone else. This is moral moral education with yeah. your children. I'm reading stories to them. I... I have <laughs> I have this little toddler book I read to my kids. It's called uh, Danny and the Candy Bar. And Danny steals a candy bar. And the mommy takes him back to return the candy bar. <laughs> and I read that story to my children before they were five. And then it happened. <laughs> and one mm -hmm. of my kids stole a candy bar. And then they told me after they ate it. And I made them go back to the store and pay for the candy bar and apologize. You know? Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's just as simple as that. Is, is a simple little way of it, getting that truth into a child. A few years ago, there was uh, a great movie that came out, maybe a decade or more now, called Cinderella Man, starring uh, Russell Crowe, and it's based on the true story of uh, the boxer James Braddock. And there's a scene in that movie, Adrian, that uh, reminds me of, or that you reminded me of with that example. In the midst of the Great Depression, when the family is down and out and has virtually nothing, and they're wondering if they can hold everything together, uh, one of the young boys uh, steals a sausage from a butcher and uh, comes home with it, and that's a big test of what will the parents do. And uh, Russell Crowe, playing James Braddock, takes the boy back to the uh, to the grocer and has him return the sausage and apologize. And then outside on the sidewalk with the two of them eyeball to eyeball, he says to him in a way that he'll never forget. He said, we don't steal. Doesn't matter how little we have. Doesn't matter how much somebody else has. We don't steal. Have you got that? And then the boy says, yeah. And to drive it home, he, Russell Crowe says, uh, are you sure? Do you really have it? You got it? And uh, I thought, wow, what a lesson. That boy probably never forgot that. Yeah, and there's another good story that's for little children if parents listening need an idea. Benjamin Franklin and his whistle. Hmm. He, he had his mom had given him a penny or something like that. A ten, Isn't it 10 penny whistle or something like that? I it's been a while since I read it. But there's a poem version and there's a, a prose version. And and uh, that story, you read that to children, and, and then at the end, you're like, well, did he make a good choice? Because mm -hmm. I think the whistle broke or something, and he realized he just wasted his money uh. in a bad choice, a bad purchase choice, you know? And so there's lots of little stories, I think, you can read to children. Oh, stories are so important. If you just lecture to kids, this is especially true the younger they are. Uh, you know, they only remember so much, but if you can impart the values that you have in mind by way of real life stories, mm -hmm. uh, I think that's what they remember. Yeah, if that's, I can it, offer a commercial yeah, for my book yet again, stories, I quite agree stories are important. And in, in why culture matters most, I actually have a, a sec whole section of a chapter on stories and why they're so important. And my argument and I, I still believe this argument is that one of the reasons why we love stories so much, we love to tell them, we love to hear them. And we also, particularly children, you'll notice love to learn stories with repetition. They particularly like to hear the same story. They like to watch the same movie over and over again, hear the same story over again. So why is this is clearly genetic because it is clearly universal. All humans love stories. And, and, and so why is that? And my argument is this is a testament of the importance of culture because we don't inherit culture genetically, not one bit of it. It, it's, it, it actually would contradict culture. Culture is that which is transferred from generation to generation through teaching and learning, not through genes explicitly. So the stories, our love of stories is rooted in it providing a mechanism through which this essential content of ideas, things about right and wrong, things about how the world works, 
pearls of wisdom. Some of it's about prudence. Some of it's about morality. It's all over the place. All, but all this stuff's important where we learn this stuff uh, in a way that is committed to memory in a deep kind of way. And, and so I, I, I think uh, Larry's quite right. Stories are everything. Um, I, I have a, a friend who's a very a pretty famous writer, and, and he's, he's often said, you know, I told him this first, but then he says it back to me like I've never heard it before, which is uh, people hate a lecture and people love a story. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it's true. So if you're a professor, the best thing you can do it to present your material as much as possible in the context of the story. And that's exactly what I try to do and how I teach economics. And that's how I teach it differently. I teach it along the timeline of history as a story about us. So from us, from our, you know, our, our first genetic instantiation all the way to the present. So it's the story of sapiens since sapiens existed and that's what's going on. Well, that draws people in because they feel like you're watching a, you know, a Nova episode or something. <laughs> it's way more interesting than supply and demand. So supply and demand make an appearance, but they make an appearance in a context that's already rolling forward to a grand story of the big picture. And I think that that, that is something that economists, um, I don't know about an F, but maybe a D plus is the grade they get in terms of how most economists teach most of the economics. So we've been talking a bit about how the family is important in terms of that function of, of passing down uh, morals and ethical framework. And I think, I think you know, we could go on some time discussing that idea further. I wonder if we could also talk about other practices that have traditionally found themselves in the home. I'm thinking of an essay that I, I read some years ago by a professor by the name of John Cutterback. And the essay, if anyone wants to look it up, is titled The Economics of Splitting Wood by Hand. And it's, it's a lovely essay in which this you know, contemporary uh, uh, philosopher professor uh, talks about his love of splitting wood. And I, I like to do this as well. And and so I enjoyed coming across this essay. And at some point he is approached by uh, a neighbor or a friend, I, I can't remember which. And this person asks him, um, he says, John, you know, what you're doing is not economical, right? Why don't you just buy the wood? You could be spending your time working on your next book, or you could be spending your time Uh, doing any number of different things that would seem to make a lot more sense from an economic standpoint. And of course, uh, Dr. Cutterback goes on to explain how uh, there is so much more value uh, beyond simply the, you know, the the monetary value of of the wood that he is splitting or or could otherwise purchase uh, in his time, but also the time he's spending with his son. And you know, uh, the quality time that's spent there and the, the what he's passing down in terms of the value of, of hard work. Um, if, uh, I, I, think he, I think he makes the point about how, you know, splitting wood uh, warms you twice, right? Uh, both when you're splitting it and when you warm it. So what, what I'm saying here is that there are some things that seem to be just very humane that are built into the life of a family, at least when we think of, of some of the traditional things that have gone on within, let's let's call it home economics. And then there's also some things that I think are, are distinctly Christian and, and some things that we've inherited from, from the, the, you know, from, from our, our Jewish heritage and, and Greek philosophy, certain things that, that relate to, um, well, for example, I'm, I'm thinking of the, the Jewish practice of, of uh, how they would save the edges of the field for the poor to come in and, and collect, uh, to provide for the community that way. And I think from, from some perspectives, that seems like a really bad economic model. So I wonder if you could speak to some of the ways in which our understanding of economics sort of fits in with what it means to be human and how we understand what it means to be human through, through the, the classical tradition. Well, I'll tackle that uh, by saying at the outset that uh, we should not view economics as everything in life. 
it goes a long way in explaining the conscious decisions we make to engage in trade with other people. And that's a big part of life, but there's so much more to life than what is purely economic. Uh, you talked about um, some of the virtues that are enhanced by the, uh, the man splitting wood with his son. Uh, to that list, I would add self-discipline. Uh, I think that's a very important character trait that uh, we should seek to instill in our young people at an early age. The idea that um, if you really want to accomplish a task, you have to kind of stick to it. You have to uh, refrain from the uh, engaging in distractions that might uh, set you off course. The whole act of self-discipline, I think, is a very healthy <clears throat> practice, and it, it's really a uh, it does have economic implications, of course. I think the more self-disciplined people tend to be the more successful economically, too. If you're flying off the handle at every little thing that comes along and going in a million directions and never focusing, you're probably not going to be a very good business person uh, or a uh, transactor with other people in the marketplace. you got to focus and, uh, and be self-disciplined to, to a significant degree. So there are a lot of factors involved in life that... Are, don't come under the rubric directly of economics. Uh, love and uh, respect and gratitude are among those features of life that may not be directly economic in nature, but they sure are important. Uh, the last one I just mentioned, gratitude. I think we underestimate uh, all too often how important it is to have a grateful uh, spirit. Uh, there was uh, a bioethicist some years ago who, uh, by the name of Emmons, who wrote a book on this issue revealing the results of some uh, studies that he and his colleagues had done on what a grateful spirit can do for a person's life. And their conclusion was that having a grateful spirit can add as much as seven years to your life. And that's really nothing more than understanding and appreciating and practicing the idea that uh, good things that happen to you in life are not entirely due to you that uh, good things happen often because other people are involved. And sometimes they're doing good things for you, even though that's not their direct intent. As Adam Smith told us, uh, uh, entrepreneurs, merchants, business people, they don't uh, go to the business of taking risks and making investments and hiring people and paying bills and producing goods because they like you. They don't even know you in most cases. They do it because there's something in it for them. Because in a free society, if you want to progress, uh, if you want to do better, if you want to have a higher income, you got to find ways to serve other people and offer them things that they'll buy willingly, hopefully not just once, but many times. So, um, yeah, there are a lot of things that aren't just uh, economic, uh, but are very critical to uh, a wholesome life. Mm -hmm. One of the themes I'm hearing here is how important moral virtue, character, is for a free society. And what I'd like to hear from both of you is some good examples of good and bad characters that have affected civics and economics. Um, in history, in story, what are some, some of the, who are some of these characters that have affected good and bad uh, that we ought to be introducing kids to in, in even what grades, like from kindergarten all the way through 12th grade? Because yeah. teachers need to, to have practical examples of resources and and where where can they turn to help teach this to children in their well, classrooms? A lot of the stuff is already out there and is already known. What's lacking is the ability to tie it to the proper context. Mm -hmm. So uh, so in other words, everyone knows about Esau. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody knows that many of his fables involve various elements of wisdom, but a lot of it is about prudence. Prudence is extremely important, right? But what very few people appreciate is the role that cultivating a, a virtue of prudence in an individual uh, and cultivating the virtue of prudence in the vast majority of individuals. So you have a population with a critical mass of prudence how indispensable that is for the society to function well. If you want to scale it up, 
suppose you have a society of people who don't who've never been taught anything about prudence. They're very base. They are just looking out for number one and they're they don't think ahead very much. They're very mentally undisciplined and so on and so forth. And they live in a very large society and it happens to be democratic. Well, that's going to be mob rule real quick, and it's just not going to work out. A democracy is a lovely thing, but it's an incredibly difficult thing to sustain. If you want a democracy, you want all the joys of democracy, and we do, you've got to do the hard work up front, and the hard work up front comes through people like Esau. But the key is to take these people that we know from literature and so on, and show how what they did fits into this broader paradigm of what it takes not just to build the perfect beast as an individual who can contribute to society, but also to sustain those institutions uh, at the macro level with such people. Wow, so it almost sounds to me like high schoolers should be reading Aesop's fables in their economics class. <laughs> that wouldn't be such a bad idea in an effort to to sure. square the circle, right. but of course they should be reading Aesop, you know, more like you know, third grade. And, but come back and, and to it. Yeah, sure. come back I mean, to right. it. You're right. I quite agree. I quite yeah. Agree. And Larry, Lawrence? Uh, uh, that's all right. Either one will do. Uh, well, like Dave, I have a book of my own I'd like to recommend in this regard uh, mm -hmm. because it pertains precisely to what we're talking about. And it's called Real Heroes, and it's 40 chapters each one you can you can read in 10 or 15 minutes each chapter uh, is about a heroic figure in the past who lived a life of character and in many cases they didn't always live a life of character they may have had, had an epiphany at some point and became a better person um, that's that's the case in more often uh, more often than not but uh, students i think going back to what we said about stories uh, a, a great story is about a real person who actually lived, who exemplified the very qualities you're trying to instill. Uh, the very first chapter in my Real Heroes book is about Cicero. And uh, of course, he's very important to uh, any classical educator. And he exemplifies one of the most important virtues, I think, of good citizenship, and that is the courage to speak truth to power the courage to make truth uh, so important that you speak it uh, at every opportunity, that you don't try to sweep it under the rug or prevaricate or, or lie. And, um, you know, you can lecture to students about that, but if you can say, hey, let me give you an example of somebody who literally put his life on the line and lost it, in fact, because he stood for truth and speaking truth to power, but you can't say that he lived a wasted life, even though he lost it, because look at the example he is to people today who are still reading about him 2,000 years later and finding great inspiration in his life. Uh, if you have a class of students and you have um, uh, some minority students present, or even if you don't, I'd, I'd say just be careful that you tell stories that appeal to people of, of every background. Um, and so, for instance, when Black History Month rolls around in February, um, if I'm speaking somewhere, I like to bring up some of the great heroes of Black America uh, in recent, uh, in the last 200 years. And sometimes when we focus on heroes of Black America, we put all the emphasis on civil rights uh, activists. And that's, you know, I mean, there's a story there that should be told. But don't forget the entrepreneurs. People like uh, Elijah McCoy. Here was a guy who was a son of slaves. He had uh, a, very little to go on when he struck out in life. And he went to work uh, at a railroad, and uh, but he was alert and observant. And he noticed that the railroads in those early days had a real problem. Uh, they couldn't go very far before you had to stop the locomotive and lubricate it, or otherwise it would overheat. Well, he ended up inventing uh, a lubricating cup that allowed the railroads to send those locomotives a lot further down the track, a lot more efficiently. And he became a very wealthy businessman, uh, marketing not only that, but other things that he, he earned 50 some patents 
Well, we should be talking about such great people, uh, black or white or any other color, male or female, because those are the people who actually solve problems. And if you just talk about problems and complain about them, uh, I don't know how much you really do to solve them. But if you're out there creating new wealth and providing employment and fixing problems that uh, everyday people uh, wrestle with, you've done a wonderful service for humankind. And, and we should emulate uh, uh, those great producers and inventors uh, of wealth. Yeah, that's really good. Mm. I, I'd like you to talk a little bit about self-governance as well. Like, h how do you think classical schools need to encourage self-governance? What changes in your experience with classical schools need to happen in order to raise students who can self-govern? It's We know it's important. Um, it's an important topic in this discussion. But if kids are being spoon fed, lectured <laughs> yeah. and having their hands held, how can the parents and teachers shift their current practices to focus on helping students learn the critical habit of self-governance? Well, I would certainly start by emphasizing with any audience, young or old, that uh, governance per se is not an option. Uh, the way I like to put it is uh, if you do not govern yourself, you will be governed. And what I mean by that is that if as a people we fail to uh, corral our worst motives and instincts, learn to live peacefully with other people, uh, learn to respect lives and rights and property and contracts of other people, then we have a chance at, uh, at great uh, progress, material, economic uh, and spiritual and uh, artistic, uh, all kinds of doors open for us if we learn that uh, essential lesson. Uh, but governance, uh, we too often think of it as purely a, a something that government does, that other people that got elected somehow uh, do to us. Mm -hmm. But I think it really starts at home. You have to govern yourself. And then if you're good at that, then you're qualified, I think, to, I think, to have something to say about how the society at large uh, is governed uh, as an elected official or an employee of government. I mean, uh, I'm one who wants to keep uh, that kind of government small and manageable. Uh, but I also understand that uh, it's necessary in order to um, keep the peace. So uh, I start with self-governance. That's if you don't have that, you're, then you're going to have some uh, other government <laughs> tell you what to do at every turn and get the students to understand the distinction there uh, and get them to understand the importance of, uh, or, of right conduct because bad conduct invariably leads to trouble for yourself, trouble for society, and probably the kind of government that few people outside of it really really want, but that's what they're going to get if they're a bunch of bad apples. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, I love Larry's point, and uh, I don't like the fact that he stole it from me before I had a chance to make it, but that's <laughs> one of the I hazards of being on the panel with him. <laughs> but uh, but I, I want to extend it a little bit. Uh, this, this idea that <laughs> governance is not an option is absolutely correct. Um, it's going to exist. The question is, how is it going to exist? So the, the key idea there is that self-governance and top-down governance are substitutes. You know, where you are on the range just depends upon how much investments you put in there. And I, and, I, and I would like to point out that one of the reasons why so many people are uh, enthusiastic about uh, homeschooling and classical education and so on and so forth is it is a... Uh, it's a response to the growing recognition that there's a growing number of people in education uh, who I think for the most part unwittingly have been duped into carrying the water for people who uh, seek to infantilize uh, the public. They, they prefer uh, people to think at kind of a child kind of level. They prefer people who lack the ability to self-govern because they prefer a world where government provides the order from the top down because they hope to uh, volunteer to provide that order. 
power or give me the ones who have the power. So I know that sounds kind of cynical, uh, and it would be if it weren't true, because it, we, it is true. It is, and it is true. That. Yeah, you're and right. children need to know that. Children need to know that when, when people are teach, t- teaching you what you want to hear and removing the consequences of your actions, um, they are helping to cultivate a person that will readily accept pseudo parentage from the government later in life as an adult when they shouldn't be, because that's what they want. And that brings me to my second point about self governance. How do you get self governance? One of the most important things for getting self governance is something that has become quite rare these days, and it's dangerous, and that is. People have to be able to fail. Mm-hmm. You know, it's when you fail and you fail big and it's on you and other people might be, I mean, they're not going to let you die, but, but otherwise they're going to, you know, they expect you to kind of bear the cost of your failure, make it right. Mm-hmm. Your brain is very impressed by the experience and it doesn't want the experience to happen again. And you get better at thinking carefully about how to think ahead about what you do, uh, which is what self-governance is all about. It it, it pays to be the person who nips and tucks his own behavior rather than is responding to the consequences of it. Just avoid those consequences by getting it right up front. That's the essence of it. Now, think about how much uh, in uh, modern K-12 education and even even, uh, even at the college level, it's it's, it's run rampant. Mm -hmm that everything is geared towards making it as easy as possible for students to learn. All of the burden is being put on the professor and the system because all children can learn, so it's your fault if they don't. They've come to expect this. This is exactly what you would expect of people who would prefer not to have partners in societies, but prefer to have subjects. And our students need to know that when you hear this stuff, it's like somebody feeding M&Ms to a child so that they can become a diabetic by the time they're 30. It's not good stuff. These are are bad people. Good people will let you have a few M&Ms every now and then, but for the most part, you're supposed to eat your Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. There's a lot of different directions we could go here. I'm, I'm reminded of Plato's warnings about the extremes of democracy. And I, I, I don't know if we have time to, to delve into that too much, but you know, this idea that, um, you know, that, that the will of the people will ultimately, um, you know, if, if, if they're just sending representatives that, that are just um, sort of giving them what they want versus what they need. And, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm putting this in very simple terms but uh, that's something that I would encourage people to look into, because all of this is connected, right? Our, our, our economics is connected with our, with our political systems, and it all goes back to the life of the family and the home. And, you know, if mom and dad are just giving, you know, Johnny and Susie whatever they want, whatever they want it, you know, those are the beginning, beginnings of um, certain expectations, right, and certain demands that they may then try to live out on a larger scale in society. But I find it interesting that both of you gentlemen, when asked for recommendations, uh, went went back, right? Went back in time to to Aesop and went back to Cicero. Um, I would like to add Dante to the list, right? I can't remember which canto it is there in um, in uh, in his work in the Inferno, but he he has a whole section of hell devoted to the sin of usury, right? right. Uh, which which I think a uh, a high schooler should be reading alongside the study of, of economics, it, it would seem. Um, so I, I just wanted to point out that both of you referred back to a historical text. And I, I wonder if we could talk to the teachers who are currently teaching a civics class. We don't want to forget our, our civics conversation. Um, and those who are teaching a high school economics class, let's say, who are tempted to primarily work with the headlines or whatever it is that's going on in contemporary society, right? The current conversation, let's say. 
versus the classical approach, which is really not to be immediately concerned, at least not in the classroom with those things, but rather to go back to uh, an older story and to show examples and, 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 and read um, where people have already wrestled with these things in the past. Maybe we could talk about the importance of not spending all of our time operating with the current headlines when we teach yeah, this stuff. I think that's important, Trey. I, I probably, uh, if, I, if I were teaching a class today, and uh, and somehow this general area came up. I think I'd want the students to understand that uh, it is not the hallmark of a good citizen to think of those who came before as not worth spending time with. I mean, just ask a student today, hey, uh, if you don't think that people who went through life in the years past and wrestled with all kinds of problems are worth paying some attention to, well, you're only condemning yourself because someday you're going to be the past. And do you want people of the future to look back and say, oh, those folks in 2022, they have, what could they possibly know? Uh, let's pay, no, pay them no attention. I don't think we'd want to be treated that way. Uh, and then when you start to look at uh, the great people of the past and the great books of the past, you begin to find, wow, they really did have something to offer. And uh Human experience didn't just begin the day you were born. Um, there's a lot that came before that is worth studying. In fact, uh, we all know the famous line from the philosopher George Santayana, those who ignore history are condemned to repeat it. There's a lot of truth to that. There's not a whole lot uh, in the world today that hasn't in some form with different personalities on the stage happened before. And if that's the case, well, then we ought to be asking ourselves, what are the lessons from those past experiences that uh, apply today? I think a good person, a good citizen, should always uh, keep one eye on the past because it offers more answers uh, and more, more guideposts than most people give it credit for. I'd like to first answer the question that I thought you were about to ask, even though you didn't, because I want to... <laughs> about a book that's more modern uh, that would deal with some of these issues at, at, at an admittedly more macro kind of level, but still uh, I think would be important uh, reading. And that's Tom Sowell's A Conflict of Visions, which is, uh, I, I, I think it's a masterpiece. I think it is brilliant. It is so well written. It's so compelling. It's so easy to digest. And it, it rings so true, and it, it, it would give students an opportunity to get a sense of how you might organize your thoughts and, and make sense of what we see there. Um, I think that the, with the, the idea of this, the, the question you did ask, though, was, it also, was a really good question about, you know, this idea of oh, well, this stuff in the news and issues and so on and so forth. Why don't we just deal with that? Well, that's kind of, I would call that bumper sticker pedagogy. And usually bumper sticker fill in the blank is pejorative, right? You don't say something's bumper sticker and you mean it's, it's bumper sticker pedig. And it, 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 let me give you an example of how pathetic it is and therefore how important classical education is. We are where we are as a result of thou literally thousands of years of evolution of ideas, thoughts, policies, institutions, culture, and that feeding on itself and feeding on itself with countless losers and dead ends, okay? That was an incredibly complex process that was fueled by some of the smartest human beings to ever live who worked as hard as anybody ever worked. And thank God they went to all that trouble or we wouldn't have what we have today. So when 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 somebody says, oh, the way we should teach this class is through current events, my first thought is to say, why don't we just go to somebody who doesn't know any chemistry whatsoever and throw the most complex stoichiometry problem at them and just say, well, what do you think it is? And now they, they can come up with something and they can move some letters around and some numbers and say, well, that looks good. But it is a pathetic superficial treatment because unless they've learned about atoms and protons and, and work their way up through the steps because there's so much content before you get to that margin of conventional issues, unless you do that, you are just filling dead time with hot air. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just pathetic. So it isn't just that 
in the past, there were things that we dealt with and we can learn from it. The very ideas are layered. They're not perfectly axiomatic, but they're kind of are. There's a lot of stuff you can't know here if you don't know here. And a lot of stuff here you can't really know if you don't. And it, that's just the way it is. And I know, okay, that's terrible. It means you've got to do a lot of work in order to really understand something. That's just, that's just the way it is. That's just, if you don't like that, you don't want to be an educated person because that's what it takes. So we need to make our students understand, our teachers understand that the, the, the most crucial ideas for sustaining a free market democracy are some of the most difficult and subtle ideas we have. I mean, after all, why weren't we doing this 80,000 years ago? I mean, we've had the current genome for over 120,000 years, and our most immediate ancestors were very nearly as smart as we are. What were, what were we waiting on? Well, we weren't waiting on anything. That those ideas are the actual substrate of the good life. It's, it's, it's every bit as important as iron ore is to steel. It just is. If you don't have the one, you don't get the other. And that is, those are just the hard facts. But that stuff that seems so remote and dated and so on is the farther back you go, the more uncool it is and the further away it is from current events, but the more accessible it is because it's involving a world that's still simple enough that mm -hmm. even a child can at least wrap their mind around the issues uh, that uh, somebody like Aristotle is talking about. Yes, I, I think both of your answers are, are spot on. And, and Adrian, please forgive me for, for, for butting here yet again, but uh, another question that comes to my mind just because I, reflecting on my own the teachers that I have sat under in high school uh, in an economics class or um, a, a history civics class, and then the and then ones that I've I've just seen sort of in, in my career as a teacher, uh, I think this is a big temptation, right? Each each teacher in his or her area of study has a temptation, and I think I think the current events approach is a major temptation uh -huh. um, for for teachers of these subjects. I, I think another temptation and another thing that, and, and, and the fact that I'm describing is a temptation, I'm showing my cards here, but something that's being currently debated right now, speaking of current events, here we go, is this question of, well, shouldn't we be making time in high school in particular for very practical classes um, in which we teach students how to, well, they used to say balance a checkbook, but I guess they don't say that anymore. You know, how to manage their bank account, how to pay their taxes, how to buy a home, all these things that it seems, um, at least from the, uh, from, from the feedback you know, uh, loop, that a whole generation of people seemingly don't know how to do very well. At least that seems, you know, if, if, you, if, you, if you just kind of jump into the world of social media, that seems to be the, uh, what a lot of people are saying. Um, and and as as a classical educator, I, I just find myself being very protective of the time and space in which we have with students. And I just wonder where all of that fits in, and if that's not something that uh, really ought to come um, as uh, sort of something that's built on top of what I what I would hold to be much more fundamental principles and stories, even. Uh, from our past that help them understand um, something more than just the, the mere practical um, application of certain practices. Well, certainly you can you can go overboard in these um, subject areas like balancing a checkbook and, and uh, teaching um, the young people about things they're going to have to deal with. If that sort of thing comes at the expense of teaching the fundamentals, such as how to critically think, how to add and subtract and multiply and divide, um, then um, I, I think you're just, you're wasting time. Uh, I, nobody ever taught me how to balance a checkbook, by the way. I just learned that. I think that's something right. as a teacher, I would say, I don't think I have to teach you that. You'll learn that. You'll learn that pretty quick. The first time you overdraw, uh, your your account, uh, you'll learn how to balance that checkbook. 
uh, let's focus instead on something Cicero said. That would seem to me to be a lot more profitable. But, uh, you know, and some of these things, too, used to be, I think, more commonly taught at home. We, we learned so much more at home when parents regarded uh, the education of their children as a priority. But we've been telling them now for 100 years, oh, no, no, that's not your job. You're not qualified. The experts have to do that in the uh, professional government-owned, government-run classroom. So you just keep out of this and uh, let them do their job. And so some of these simple things that uh, kids would learn when parents took time out to teach them, I guess we were having to do some of that in the, the even the higher grades, but that's not where it ought to happen. Uh, that's not the, the purpose of uh, formal classroom education. Shouldn't be in it anyway. I, I would like to expand a little bit on Larry's point. This is yet another example of the margin of, of the family and the family serving as a substitute and something else trying to substitute for the family. And wh why, why would we want that? Well, if you want to run societies from the top down, the last thing on you, earth you want are strong families uh, inculcating uh, values and uh, creating a sense of self-discipline and self-starting. So you got a whole bunch of people who can think for themselves and when they hear nonsense, cock their head and say, mm, I don't think that makes any sense and, and, and actually articulate a, a meaningful criticism. You don't want that. What you want are people who just want stuff done for them. Interesting story about the checkbook. You know, I learned how to figure out my own checkbook because there's actually instructions from the bank on how to balance the checkbook. <laughs> They're right there. And so that's how I did it. And then uh, I, I, like many young adults, I was, I guess, 17 uh, by the time this happened. I was lazy and sloppy and so on. And I got my checkbook all screwed up and it was incredibly embarrassing and humiliating. So what then happened? Who then made sure I really learned how to do the check? Uh, Self-governance here. <laughs> yeah. It was my mother. Oh, did, okay. My mother, by the way, who was in my family. My mother, who did not even go to high school. Now, oh. she didn't learn how to balance. <laughs> of course, they didn't teach that stuff back then anyway. But even if they did, it wouldn't matter. Why? Because my mother did know how to read. That was her ace card. And she had learned how to balance. And I, I'll bet you at some point she screwed her checkbook up too. Mm -hmm. And she understood, yeah, you know, you just got to be disciplined about this or you're going to really regret. Right. The ripple effect of bounce checks. <laughs> and it yeah. never happened again. <laughs> oh, I bet it didn't. <laughs> never again. Thanks, Mom. Oh, that's great. Well, uh, we're we're out of time, but I, I feel like I could keep going. And I, I really want our listeners to respond to this by posting questions like on our Facebook page. And maybe we can email you guys some questions or have you back on again. Um, we, we always end with a concluding question, but and I'm going to let Trey ask that. But before we do, I did want to ask, are there any other resources you would recommend for high school teachers to use in the classroom? Uh, I'll recommend my website. <laughs> sure, what is it? <laughs> well, it's uh, only because there's a lot of uh, history and economics and uh, political thought and in the blog section of the website. It's uh, lawrencewreed.com, L-A-W-R-E-N-C-E, -E, middle initial W, last name R-E-E-D, -E -E Lawrence W. Reed, no punctuation, at I'm sorry, no, uh, .com. sorry. Yeah, and we'll put that in the show notes too. Okay, thank you. It, so what kind of resources are on your website? Um, everything I write, uh, which uh, often is uh, heavily historical. Uh, there's a lot of Roman history, a lot of British history, and as well as American. There's a lot of economics. There's some commentary on current events. But um, again, I, I'm more of a fan of learning from the past than I am from... Mm -hmm. uh, dealing with the, uh, the politics of the moment. But um, so uh, people will find, and there's a good search engine on it, so people can find almost uh, anything they're looking for in, uh, in history anyway. Okay. Do you have anything to recommend, David? Uh, not really. I wish I did. Um, I, um, 
the reason why I don't is because uh, I have such a radically different way of doing things that I'm always trying to get my own ball going. And so I don't really spend that much time uh, looking at the content that's out there to try to pick what I like the most. Mm-hmm. I just teach stuff my own way, which ma- basically requires me to make make the stuff up or draw it directly from history <laughs> on my own. So a lot of it ends up being economic history. Right. And a lot of classical schools hire content experts. So if they're hiring somebody that has a degree in civics and economics, then that person ought to know what are the good texts to bring into the classroom. I think I'm interested in this uh, A Conflict of Vision by Thomas Sowell that you recommended. Is this something that high schoolers can read? Absolutely. Uh, There's only a few books that have really made a big impression on me, and and this is one of them. Mm -hmm. It's right up there with books like uh, Richard Dawkins' The Selfish Gene, which Mm -hmm. is a must. Uh, yeah, another book that's kind of like that that I think is incredibly uh, important is Robert Frank's uh, Passions Within Reason, wrote back, way back in 1988, which was actually a very, very influential book, an incredibly important book about how economists get the topic of trust all wrong and uh, why getting it right is so important and what, what's the right way to think about trust. and. I think he's about 80% right, and he was way ahead of his time, and that book uh, was uh, one of the inspirations behind my first book, which was uh, The Moral Foundation of Economic Behavior. So would those books be appropriate for high schoolers to read or the teacher to read as a resource? Um, I, I, a selfish gene high schoolers could read. Passions Within Reason might be more for the teachers. Mm-hmm. Oh, but, uh, Adrian, but I think the conflict divisions of seniors could certainly read it. Okay. Adrian, I just thought of uh, three others that would be good f- uh, for any age, actually. And they relate to an area we've touched on but haven't gotten into in great detail, and that is uh, the area of self-improvement. Um, uh, one, uh, one is a classic by Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People all these decades after it was written and revised, I think, many times, it still remains one of the best uh, books for improving yourself uh, that uh, is out there. And a more recent one is by a woman named Olivia Cabani, C-A-B-A-N-E, and it's called The Charisma Myth. And uh, I found found that book to have a gem on every page. If you want to know, you know, how can I make myself a better person in a way that um, others will uh, learn from and and seek to uh, listen to, that kind of thing. That's a great one. And the third uh, is called The Memory Book. I almost forgot the title. (laughs) The Memory Book. Uh, It's a classic in memory training. Anybody can read it. And it's by Jerry Lucas Mm -hmm. and Harry Lorraine, uh, the memory book. Oh my gosh, I couldn't put that down. And uh, one result of it was I used to memorize within 10 minutes, a class of 75 students and do that five times in a day to five different classes and call them all off by name uh, thereafter. And the students, I I discovered they they work twice as hard for you if they think you really know them. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) that's great. These are great. So, Trey, why don't you go ahead and close with our with our last question? Right. Well, I think both of you address uh, the question of uh, books that you would recommend. Uh, but there, there's a bit of a, a twist on this one, which is, um, well, I'll give you two options. You can either um, mention a quote that has, has, has a resonating impact on your life or perhaps a book that you wish you had read sooner in your life. Um, Perhaps, uh, Dr. Rose, you could, you could go first. That's a pretty hard question. Um, a quote. I don't want to have, have one off the top of my head. A, a book that I wish I had read sooner. Uh, that's a little easier. Um, and uh, that would, I, I, I hate to sound like I'm, beating the same drum, but I didn't read a conflict of visions until I was in my thirties. Um, and, uh, if I had read that when I was in high school, 
it would have really changed things for me. When I was an under when I was an undergrad, I had to take a graduate uh, level political theory and philosophy course, and I was furious about it. I, I, I thought it was going to be the stupidest waste of time ever in my life because I was all math science guy. You know, why would I do this? And it turned out to be like my favorite class of all time. I just I was just blown away. And if I had read something like a conflict of visions as a high school senior. I wouldn't have had to wait until I was two years into my undergraduate degree to see the joy of struggling through literature written by some of the smartest humans to ever live, who are working as hard as anybody has ever worked to try to help us organize society in a way that can give us the good life. I mean, mm-hmm. could, there can't be a higher calling than that. You're simply trying to make better world for your fellow man today and tomorrow mm-hmm. but uh, i never did get to read conflict solutions at that time so uh, that would be uh, that's my commercial for conflict divisions thomas soul will be happy to hear that i plugged this book three times <laughs> well, I, I know he is an avid listener to our podcast there you go <laughs> oh great yeah maybe maybe you, if anybody has connections that'd be great we all admire him very much <laughs> I'll close with a quote, and it's uh, one of my very favorites, and the truth of it is unbelievably profound, so profound that if if the world could uh, come to understand it, uh, I, there would be so much less mischief, uh, but it's from the Nobel uh, Prize-winning economist F.A. Hayek, H-A-Y-E-K, and he said, the curious task of economics is to convince men of how little they know about what they imagine they can design. Think of that. The curious task of economics is to convince men of how little they know about what they imagine they can design. Uh, The world is just full of of, uh, busybodies and uh, know-it-alls. People who run around, I mean, they haven't solved their own problems. They haven't fixed their own lives yet. Uh, they haven't had time to do that because they're too busy trying to fix everybody else, trying to plan the lives of other people. Well, Hayek uh, in this quote says, you know, uh, even the smartest person in the world is nowhere near as smart as he thinks he is. Uh, uh, and, I, I have a quote for you that follows up on Hayek if you want one. If you're yeah. a silly Aiken sure. quote. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Arthur Kessler. Uh, philosophy is far too serious a matter to be left to philosophers. Mm. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. That's good. And I take that as, and I mean, there's a lot of ways to take that, but but to me, what that's uh, it isn't so much a swipe at philosophers as it is a swipe at us for us not taking philosophy seriously enough. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We yeah. need to get in the game of that. We, 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 we can't just let them worry about that stuff because that stuff affects how people vote, affects yeah. our ability to self-govern as a society and as individuals. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Thank you guys so much for this. This was so delightful. I never thought I could ever say that economics was delightful because, of course, my experience in high school was a boring lecture-based approach. (laughs) I didn't have a classical education. So this was really, really fun. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Adrian, Trey, Dave. I've enjoyed it very much, too. Me, too. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. We invite you to experience the art of teaching through interactive learning communities at our Patreon page, Visit patreon.com forward slash classical education. Also, be sure to join the conversation on our Facebook community at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash classical education. We are a listener supported podcast, so your support makes this podcast possible. As the great artist and educator John Ruskin once wrote, Well, my friends, the final result of the education I want you to give your children will be, in a few words, this they will know what it is to see the sky. They will know what it is to breathe it, and they will know, best of all, what it is to behave under it, as in the presence of a Father who is in heaven.